Offered by the European School Education Platform, the European Commission's Platform for School Education in Europe. My name is Nikki and I will be your host for today. Just some practical information before we officially start the webinar, just so you know it will be recorded and the recording may be used for dissemination purposes. Uh, also, if you have any questions during the webinar, we will have 15 minutes dedicated specifically for questions, but feel free to type them in the chat and then, then we'll eventually get to them. So the focus for today's webinar is how to become an e-twinning school, shared leadership in practice. It's my pleasure to invite on the virtual stage Donald O'Reilly, who is a senior leader at Kilorglin Community College in Ireland from 2007 to 2019. This webinar will focus on Donald's journey as an educator, how e-twinning and Erasmus Plus became embedded in the school culture, and aims on how to provoke participants to reflect on their own context and school journey. So without further ado, uh, I will pass on the floor to our speaker, Donal. Thank you very much, Nikki, and uh, welcome and hello to everybody um, from, from, from Ireland uh, and Sinigu. Love and greetings across, across Europe. Um, OK, my slides aren't advancing, so let's see. OK, so as I, I, I'm coming from Ireland, that's us in the small little red dot down in the southwest of Ireland um, in the beautiful wild Atlantic way surrounded by some beautiful mountains uh, on a clear day. That is actually Ireland's tallest mountain, highest mountain. Um, and I have the luxury of having a beautiful beach close by as well. So, you know, come visit. And that is my piece for the, the, the promotion of tourism for Ireland. This is my school. Uh, which Nikki said correctly, I was uh, um, there as a senior leader for uh, a number of years and which I will return to again very, very soon. And we were lucky to receive the e-school, uh, e-twinning school label uh, for 2021. So what this is, um, this this is an overview of, of me. Um, I have been teaching for a shocking 27 years. Uh, I have had the luxury of working in seven secondary schools in Ireland, as well as working with European Schoolnet um, and as an e-twinning ambassador as well, which has afforded me the opportunity to see different schools in the Irish con context and also to see your schools at European level as well. And I've uh, appreciated um, having that opportunity because um, many teachers find that they maybe work in one school for their whole career or maybe a num uh, only two. So I'm, I'm delighted to be able to to take that, to take the learning from that and share that learning with you today. So just to get your fingers uh, warmed up um, and as people are still joining from the lobby, I'd like you to pop into the chat um, so I can look back afterwards and answer the following questions. Um, number one, what country are you joining us from today? So pop in the answer, just the country you're coming from. And number two, um, if you were to decide as we come to the end of January um, on a Monday, a Monday afternoon, what animal would you choose to describe how you are feeling today? Um, as I said, I'm joining from Ireland. Today I feel like a lion. Today I like, feel like a lion that I'll that I'll take on. I can take on the world, but maybe by Friday I might not might not feel like such a lion. So I'd welcome your comments uh, in the chat there for what country you're joining us from and what animal you would choose to describe how you are feeling today. And we'll move on. So my presentation today is is based around the European the e twinning school mission but also in an effort to contextualize it for for my school and my story uh, I hope that whether you're new to e twinning uh, an intermediate e twinner or a, an expert e twinner um, that you will take something out of this and I welcome uh, your connections afterwards and I do hope that you learn something and take take away after today. I would also invite you, and this is something that I have um, begun 
in the in in the last ten years, I have be began to reflect on my practice and my interactions with people, because I used to find it frustrating when dealing with students and teachers and parents and and other stakeholders. Um, and I began reflecting on what I can change because I have no power to change other people, but I do have the power within myself to change myself and change practices in my own classroom or in my own environment. So I would invite you today as you listen and journey with me through my own journey, I would invite you to be reflective and I assure you the more reflective you are, the more effective you are. So the first statement uh, in, in the mission is eating schools of a commitment to shared leadership. Now this is a, a, a bold statement, a large statement, an ambitious statement. And I would ask myself and I would urge you to ask yourself is how can we achieve this? And who is responsible to that commitment of shared leadership? Delving deeper into the text, it states that the school principal and teacher leaders, and this is something that's very, very close to my heart. When I look back on my 27 years of teaching, I believe I was a school leader long before I became a formal school leader. And I think that gave me job satisfaction and it certainly contributed positively to my classroom environment, my school environment and the school community. And how do we how do we um, how do we do this? How do we develop the shared leadership? How do we act as teacher leaders? Um, what should we focus on? I would say that relationships and trust are key and they don't happen easily. They don't happen lightly and we need to put some work in. I would also say that you must have a culture of accepting mistakes and learning from them. Obviously, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is a sign of madness. But if you accept, make mistakes and accept the mistakes and learn from them, then that is very that is that is a good um, foundation to any school community. And of course, communication, communication, communication. If you ask any teachers in any school or any school community, communication is key. What does that look like in Kilorgan Community College? I found that leadership was a, a, a type of a dirty word. Teachers thought leadership equated to more, uh, more work, more work for them. So I began identifying leaders, identifying leadership, examples of leadership and practice, and discussing what I've seen and explaining why I thought they were leaders, and that empowered them and it got them reflecting and it got them thinking. And that was the cultivation of leadership, small conversations, simple conversations, encouraging people. When I saw the opportunity or created the opportunity to allow someone display these leadership skills or traits, I did so in small steps. And I think that's that's uh, important as well. Small because if there's a mistake, it's not critical. And we learn from that and small because you don't want to overburden somebody as well. So in, in those small steps, you're creating the space to lead and you're allowing uh, the, the leaders of the school, the teacher leaders in the school to express themselves. I would be mindful of delegation. I, I would be mindful of creating that space because delegation sometimes is seen as handing out jobs. You know, that's your job and you're asking me to do that. Uh, so when you do delegate, you hand it over 100 percent and you allow the person to make it their own. In Kilarglan, I often had the mantra that the first time I asked somebody to do a task that I would have normally done it, uh, they would do it maybe not as good as I would have done it. The second time they would do it as good as I would ever have done it. And the third time they would have done it, they would have done it much better and more efficiently and more effectively than I would ever have done it. So, you know, you have to wait and you will have to allow people to grow and develop. As I again, when I reflect back in my school um, and I often made the mistake of going too fast and I had to check myself and I had to remember 
that if you want the old African proverb, proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and that is something that the mistake that I made sometimes, um, particularly in my early years, you know, having an idea and going it alone, going fast, but being too far of every, ahead of everybody else then to be able to share that and bring together a team and the school community. Another statement is that the e twinning schools display a strong commitment to collaboration, sharing and teamwork. Now, this is um, something I'm passionate about because you can say collaboration and you can mean collaboration. And I think far too often um, I have heard the word collaboration being used, but when I look to see it, I don't see real collaboration. And we must accept that real collaboration can be messy. It's not clinical, it's not easy. It will fail and you have to come back and try it again. And once you accept that and you keep trying, um, you will be successful. Again, it's easy for me to collaborate with my colleague that I am friendly with outside of school. But it's much more of a challenge for me to collaborate with a person inside in school who has different interests uh, to me. But I think that's where we need to push ourselves. We need to be professionals. And we need to get outside that zone and collaborate with everybody. Sharing, it's important to share. And again, when I was going to school and when I was um, training as a teacher, the mindset was not to share. The mindset was you, you, uh, you, you're working inside your classroom and you, you don't share what you're doing. You develop resources, you don't share them. Thankfully, that has changed. Um, and inside in Killarney Community College, sharing is part of our culture. And we would encourage you to share inside and outside of the classroom across your professional networks. And teamwork is important as well in achieving this aim for the e twinning um, mission. But again, this doesn't happen easy. And what I have always done, not always, but I've done more recently is I've asked, am I a good team player? What can I bring to the team? How can I make this team better? Because previously I used to be looking at others and saying what, you know, pointing out their challenges rather than focusing on myself. So how can you take this back to your own context? In Killarden Community College, we would have uh, had structured subject department meetings. So previously we would have had, so this trying to build a team and, and bring a formality to it and bring some type of, of system of collaboration and sharing. So structured subject department meetings, keeping it simple. One, one page of minutes, a few notes, a few bullet points based on actions. What, what's going to what's going to be done and who's going to do it? We also supported a rotating coordinator. So whether there was two in the department or 22 in the department. Everybody would get a chance at being a coordinator. And what that does then is it, 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 it doesn't allow one person just to take over. Everybody knows that their turn is going to come. They're invested in it um, and they know that when their chance comes, they can make their own mark as well. The communities of practice uh, were very much encouraged in our school, and that's where teachers of that had shared interests came together outside of school time, but outside of those people that were in uh, school as well. So you're sharing with other schools. Whenever teachers went on um, professional development or Erasmus or involved in e-twinning, we always encourage show and tell sessions at staff meetings or mini teach meets. We also promoted uh, teachers to attend national and international teach, teach meets where there was a desire and where it was appropriate. Team teaching was something we explored as well, and it took many, many years, but it allowed that that uh, professional dialogue to take place between teachers in subject areas. And again, back to creating a safe space for that to, that to happen. Go slowly, discuss what's to be done, how it's to be done, and, and what are the parameters. And again, accept that mistakes are going to be made by everybody. Open your classroom door. When I was a teacher, I was king of my own classroom and I did my own work. And in Killarden Community College, I'm not sure why 
or how it happened, but I opened my classroom door. And what that allowed is it brought the classroom out into the corridor and the corridor into the classroom. And what happened then was teachers passing or students passing. They saw what was happening in the classroom. And then somebody would stop and then somebody would step over the threshold of the door. And then I would use that opportunity then to have a professional conversation about what I was doing, explaining what I was doing, how, how I was doing it, why I was doing it. And I would invite input from the, the students in the classroom as well. And all these little things are building your culture, building your relationships with students, building your relationships with, with other teachers and other members of the school community. The next statement focuses on students in each winning schools are agents of change. And that's the student voice to me. And I'd invite you to reflect where are you now on the journey of including student voice? And where do you want to be? Where I want to be is referencing the, the, the Lundy model, Professor Laura Lundy, an Irish professor, where she um, advocates for student voice across the whole school community. That's not where we are now, but that's where we strive to be. When we started in Killarden Community College, we had a student council. Our very, very first student council were handpicked. So obviously the student council gave us feedback that we wanted to hear. Not really great for the student voice. After a number of years, we decided to do random focus groups, and that's where the richness really came from from our students, because these were randomly picked students with additional needs uh, across the board, across the years of different ages. And they spoke very, very openly and honestly. Now, when they spoke openly and honestly, we had created that safe environment for them to do so, and nobody was going to challenge them about what they were saying or who they were saying it about. But we listened, we consulted, we listened, we acted on it, and then we went back to them for feedback as well. And that's a cycle that continues to exist in the school today. And because the student council is seen as a voice for students, we're getting a blend of students onto that student council now, and it's democratically voted upon. We must make sure that it's inclusive, and not exclusive student voice, like the example I gave you at the start, where, where we were very exclusive at the beginning, but now we strive to be inclusive, and now we strive to have student voice captured across the whole school all day. Involve the students in the decision-making pro pro process. Make sure they're represented at the table. So when we were developing our code of behavior, the students were involved, when we were discussing learning environments, the students were involved. We asked them to take control of their learning spaces, whether that's designing them, painting them, filling them, all driven by students. And I have their right on windows. You must think I'm crazy saying right on windows. But as we developed the culture of using our spaces and getting students involved, Somebody had the brainwave of getting window markers. The window markers you see the butcher write his uh, messages and his advertisement on. And where collaboration was happening, we were able to use that extra space. So students would gather around a window, be able to write on it, and it was inspirational, but it was capturing their, uh, their voice and, and ensuring that they were the agents of change as well. I invite you to consider would you sit down and eat your lunch with students in your school? And what would the effect of that be? I attended the BET Educational Technology Show in London many, many years ago, and I was inspired by a school principal who knocked down the staff canteen and invested in the student canteen, but students and teachers all sat together. So I experimented with that in my school, and I discovered for the first few weeks when I sat in the school canteen with the students, I, I was left alone. Nobody came to speak to me. But over time, and as it became a custom and a practice, I ended up 
sharing the table and sharing stories with students during my lunchtime. And again, that's that is something that it sends a signal to the students that there that there's equality in the school, that it's not an us and them. And I built relationships and I I found students able to approach you and, and I felt more approachable because of the, the bonds that were built up at that time. E-twinning schools are models for other schools. It's important to model what you believe in. I'm a parent of three young boys, age 10, age 11, 10 and 6. And I can tell them what to do and what not to do all day, all week, all year. But inevitably what they will do is what I model. And I think the same goes for teachers and the same goes for schools. So I would encourage e-twinning schools to, to model what they're doing, to share their learning, but more importantly, share your mistakes. And by sharing your mistakes, you're reflecting on your mistakes and you're reflecting on your own learning as well. And use your school's network, your local international, um, to make sure that you're, you're spreading it across a wider network as possible. And as you share, of course, you will be learning as well in return. And just remember to be authentic. And be yourself. And you don't need to be perfect. Nobody expects you to be perfect. So don't try to be perfect. When I look at this. Um, part of the mission being models for other schools. I reflect on when I share. When I share what we do in school, when I share at webinars like this and in the preparation for this, and when you have to explain what you were doing and why you're doing it, I think we develop a greater need, a greater um, understanding of what we're doing. Because we're we're experiencing it, but we're teaching others as well. We're explaining the why. Um, and that's one of the benefits when you are modeling and when you are sharing across your networks, you're really drilling down into your own practice, into your own learning, into your own experience, um, and you're taking away that as well, as well as sharing with the others who are on a, a journey of their own. E-tuning schools are inclusive and innovative learning organizations. And this is very important to get the balance right. Inclusivity is, is as important now as it ever was. And being innovative is is important and it can solve many, many of our challenges and it can create opportunities. But we need to get a plan and we need to get the balance right. As I reflect on my time in Killarney Community College, I think sometimes I got a little bit overexcited by the innovation. And maybe I forgot the inclusivity. So it's important for me to remind myself that it's a balance and one can complement the other, but I would certainly say that inclusivity has to take priority. Universal design for learning for me, even though I'm only on the beginning of the journey, certainly is a, a game changer for me. Uh, I always was found it challenging in the classroom dealing with students of different abilities, and I come from I come from a background in, of the technologies where I always had students with varying abilities and very often I had students with additional needs because of the nature of my subject. And I always, always found it difficult and challenging when I was asked to differentiate because differentiation to me meant giving different people different work. And young people are so smart. The young person with additional needs knows that they're after getting a different sheet or different homework from the person next to me. So with Universal Design for Learning, and I'd invite you to, if you haven't looked into it already, to explore it. With Universal Design for Learning, it really uh, addresses this issue at the design stage of your lessons and your schemes of work. And hopefully it will, it will lead to more inclusivity inside the classroom. 
I think in Clarden we always experimented with our teaching methodologies, but you can experiment. Experimentation without evaluation isn't very beneficial. So again, the, the change happened for me as a teacher when not only was I experimenting, but I was asking why and how. What changes were happening as a result of, of me changing my teaching methodologies? And of course, who did I ask? The students, the student voice, because they are they are the users, they are the end users, and they know what they like best. And it will surprise you what they like best. Learning spaces, again, we always, um, we try to maximize our learning spaces in the school. And if you look at your own school in your own context, I wonder how many of the bigger spaces are only utilized in the morning, at break time, and at lunchtime. And we began asking ourselves, why? Why are the biggest spaces in our school the least used? So we expanded the classrooms, not, not, not physically, not, not, not the walls, but we expanded our teaching and learning to fill those spaces when appropriate, depending on what lesson you were doing, depending on what topic. Um, and we looked at what we had, we designed learning spaces into them. And it has been hugely successful. Of course, there's no solution is the silver bullet or a big bang approach. And it needs to be, you need to be cautious. You need to experiment. You need to take time. And you need to make sure that the one size does not fit all. What's working for me in my classroom may not work for everybody in everyone's classroom. And the one feedback piece of feedback that we got from students is that students like um, varied learning and teaching methodologies varied learning spaces because as they go through the school they want don't want the same thing over and over again so that brings me to the end of the first part of the of the webinar on how to become an e-twinning school you might ask me why <clears throat> and i would say why not in preparation for this I saw my national agency, eTwinning Ireland, post something on Twitter advertising the closing date for eTwinning schools with the text, the opportunity to have creativity, teamwork, and international awareness of your staff and students acknowledged. So why wouldn't you do it? Plus, I would add the unintended consequences. All of the other things that happen in a school as you're journeying to be an e-twinning school. Many of the, the, the biggest successes that we have enjoyed in our school, the, the learning experiences, the successes of students haven't been planned. They have been as a, a byproduct of something that we were doing for e-twinning or for something curriculum based. And they're the ones that are that I enjoy most. The ones you the successes that you hadn't planned for. So for now, in the interest of best practice and well-being, I'd invite you to stand up and stretch, rehydrate for two minutes, but consider, as I invited you earlier, to be reflective. When you reflect in your own situation, is there any one action? that you can begin tomorrow in your school or organization. Tomorrow, next week, next month. Something that you can control and one action. So I've used up one minute of that two minutes and I'm just going to stretch and, uh, and grab a glass of water now and I'll be back to you in 60 seconds.
So for anybody that has just joined us, we haven't stopped. We're just doing a stretch break. I'm going to resume in 30 seconds. OK, so if everybody is ready. So some policy messages to consider, and I got to revisit Killarden Community College again towards the end of this presentation, and I'd welcome some uh, questions in in 10 minutes as well if if you uh, if you have any. I'm not going to bombard you with with text. Um, and though even though English is my first language, I tend to focus on bullet points. And in this policy message, it, it urges us to support a culture of collective engagement and responsibility within your school. And overall, what I would encourage you to do is, and, and speaking from my own, my own experience, I spent many, many years in my comfort zone. And it's lovely in the comfort zone. It's really nice. You're doing your teaching. You're not challenged. You're getting on with business. But are you growing? Are you growing professionally? And are you growing personally? And to get into the growth zone, you must go through the, the, the fear zone first, and then you're in the learning zone. But then you must push and you must have, you must be strong and know what your vision is to get into the growth zone. So looking at the, the culture of collective engagement and the responsibility within your school and to be responsible, you need to get out of that comfort zone and head towards the growth zone. And what are the key messages that you are being asked or what you should consider? Supporting learning through a shared mission, well-being for all. And well-being for all means living well-being, not just talking about well-being, living it. Distributed leadership, new and innovative opportunities. Encourage yourself and encourage others to take on teach on leadership roles. Strong communication between schools, parents and learners. And if you take note of that last piece between schools, parents and learners, you will notice that that is the theme that is coming through these policy messages. And if I was to, to, to state one of the, 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 the major changes in our culture in Killarden Community College would be, it was the, the engagement of everybody, the collective engagement, having everybody at the table, having everybody at the voice, or, or having, having a voice. And I think then people feel included and that's your full inclusion or heading towards full inclusion. Mobilizing resources within the school and community. For many, many years, I was frustrated and I frustrated myself about the system, about the local authority, about the government, about departments of education and what could be done or what should be done. And I was only angering myself because I had no control over it. And in recent years, I have I still get frustrated, but I ask myself, where does this lie in the zone? And if it's in, if it's out of my control, I put it out of my head. I acknowledge the problem and I put it out of my head. If I have some control over it, I, I, I ask myself, how can I control this? Can I, can I make recommendations? Can I make a plan? But for the most of the time, I spend my time focusing on what's in my control. In the center of the circle, what can I do now for myself? What can I do now for my school? What can I now do for my students to have immediate impact? Looking at new resources, new partnerships, working with the broader community. 
how are the, are, are the current resources we have used effectively? Have we are we collaborating? Is it real collaboration? And do we have partnerships with teachers and others? And I'll give you one example of this about mobilizing the resources within the school and community in Killarney Community College. I was at a a European school net in the future classroom, and I spoke about this and the conversations were going towards what could be done and what was not being done. And it all resulted in more money and more time. And I wanted to get my students working around in a circle. And we had rectangular tables, so we had 12 rectangular tables, two students sitting at each one, 24 students, maybe more. So I went back to the school in one room. We took out 12 and we cut oval egg shape um, shapes out of large sheets of timber. We screwed them down on top of a table. We put them back into the room. So each table now had six spaces. Five for students and a space in for a teacher to sit down as well if they wanted to. That cost the school. Maybe 100 euro. 100 euro. Had it an impact? Phenomenal. Within. Two years. Every teacher in every classroom had that same setup, but different, slightly different. Some wanted color tables. Some wanted different measurements on their tables. Some wanted whiteboard in the middle of the table so they could work. So for 100 euro investment into each room over a two year period, we totally changed the teaching and learning inside in the school. So when you when you look at your own culture, be creative. And focus on what you can control. As opposed to what's out of your control. Participation in networks. Cannot be. Um, cannot be measured enough. But you, you must be aware of the networks you're in. When you're in the staff room, when you're having a cup of coffee. Or when you're at the, the water cooler getting some water. You're having conversations that that's a network. Try to have professional conversations whenever you can. Ask questions. Be willing to listen. We're very lucky that we have the huge networks available to us now across Europe and internationally because of the World Wide Web, because of European Schoolnet and the European Commission. And they are all very important. But the network in your own school. Is probably one of the most important that you will have. And again, like I said before. It's easy to talk to the person that you have support the same football team. Or that you have something common in common with. But how about speaking to the person that you don't know much about? Find out about them, have a professional conversation with them. And you'd be surprised at what you might find out. Because that person could be an expert. They could have a certain area of focus that they are interested in, that they might want to share with you. Encourage those people that you don't know on staff to participate in networks. And again, the community partners are mentioned here as well. And the opportunities for collective learning. As I was preparing for this um, presentation, and actually only 30 minutes ago or an hour ago, I decided to put this in because these are, these are two phrases. I don't know, uh, are they quotes? Um, I, I don't know where they came from, but there are two phrases that I, that I think of a lot. And the second one actually is something that has been highlighted to me only recently with some, um, part of my journey that I'm going through at the moment. But there is no fail, there is no mistake. You achieve or you learn. And that's for me, I achieve or I learn. And I also look at. Growing. To my disappointments. 
as much as through my successes. And I feel that I grow much more personally and professionally through the disappointments and where I feel I have failed as through my successes. And I would I would urge you to consider that and use that as a platform to, to stay positive about whatever happens in your journey or on your journey, whether it's personal or professional. So my journey spanned in Killarney Community College from 2007 right up to 2023. Um, there were many changes along the way. Um, I became deputy principal in 2007. We had a lot of staff retirements in 2010. I became acting principal in 2019. I started working for my um, government, Department of Education, Ministry in 2020. COVID arrived to us all. 2022 came. And who knows what the future holds? I could speak about that whole journey for a week because there were so many interesting things happened along the way, some which were e-twinning related and some maybe not. And I've just listed some of the changes there from 2007 to 2023 for you to, to take a look at or take a screenshot. Um, and maybe they might prompt you or nudge you or inspire you to say, oh, yes, I could focus on one of those. Because it, whatever, whatever work you do can't be... Um, it has to be contextualized for your school and your context. And there are some more there that you might reflect upon. And you might say that, yes, that suits me. I like that approach. And of course, e-twinning and Erasmus Plus are very much interlinked. And the benefits that we have experienced from being involved in both are immeasurable. They're just huge. We have we have friends for life made. I have developed my professional networks. And. The un unintended consequences of projects has been phenomenal. So with that, I think I'm just about on schedule. Thank you very much. Gun of Mahagut in Irish in our Irish native tongue, and I would welcome any questions or comments that you would have now. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, thank you very much, Dono, for a nice uh, overview on some of the workings of your school um, in relationship to each winning. We do have a couple of questions. Um, first, how can we influence the leaders to encourage them to become an each winning school? There's a very good phrase is how to lead when I'm not in charge. It's actually a book. So the question is how, how to influence. Start by conversations. Conversations and, and I, I do understand that uh, the formal school leaders, the principals and deputies have many, many things on their agenda. Some school leaders, some principals have a fear. I suspect that when a teacher comes and suggests something, that they themselves think, oh, this is more work for me. This is more work for me. So if you use your terminology and say, I'm really interested in this. I think it will benefit the school and the students. If you can map it into your, 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 your national strategy, the European, the, 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 the ministry strategy, the plan for the school, and actually package it in such a way that the principal goes, of course, we must get involved in this. And you say, and I'm willing to do the work with you and for you. And I think that's that's the, that's that's the most you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually do have a, a question myself. Uh, you said in the beginning that before, just in general, as a teacher, when you were like gathering resources or just finding new ways of teaching, that before it was more like every man for himself, kind of, that there wasn't this culture of sharing. Can you talk about maybe why you think that is when you saw this, the shift that you said took place that now it's like, you know, kind of more open and trying to work together to get the best uh, learning practices. Wow. Um, 
Yeah. I don't know. Again, I don't think there's any one thing. I think there's a realisation. Um, I suppose with the, with, with, with the age of the internet going so crazy and social media and Instagram, it's very hard not to share something now. It's very hard. It's very hard to actually copyright something now. So if you had something and you didn't want it shared, um, you'd struggle. But as well as that, I do think that people are realizing that team, the, the value of team. Um, and as teaching has become harder, teaching has become, I think, across Europe, across the world, teaching is not easy. And it is more challenging. And if you're trying to solve a challenge, two heads is better than one, and four heads is certainly better than one. And I think you know all those phrases that we've coined. There's no no point in reinventing the wheel, and so on and so forth. So to answer your question, I think there's a realization there now that you can't go it alone, or you shouldn't go alone. That you should learn from other people's mistakes. The other thing is. I think people are, are admitting their mistakes now and they have the confidence to go, yeah, I did that and it failed. Can anyone tell me why? I'm okay. sorry? I think people have the confidence to, to, to stand up and say, you know, I failed or I, I, I tried this and they're looking for help. So I think that's why. Mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting that um, like a lot of the topics that are taught, talked about now that are taught in classrooms are things, you know, problems that we're dealing with as a society together. Um, so it's also like a societal way of we should be tackling these issues together. Um, I do not see any more questions in the chat. If you have any, please type them. Uh, the, I saw uh, quite a few questions about whether the presentation will be shared. Um, Yes, and the recording will also be um, used for dissemination purposes. So the recording will also be available after the fact. Maybe we can wait in case uh, we have any more last minute questions. But then uh, if not, then we can maybe wrap up uh, a little earlier here. Also, a uh, evaluation form was shared in the chat. Uh, if you could please fill that out so we could get your feedback on the webinar uh, all around, that would also be greatly appreciated. Okay. Um, There's a question in there, actually. Yes, I see. Uh, I see. What would you change if you were to start over your journey as an educator? Thank you for the meeting. So I, at, at the age of 18, I um, accidentally, uh, it, it was one of my options. I'm not sure at 18, does anybody know they want to be a teacher? But at 18, I decided. It wasn't like it was a vocation. Um, it was seen as a good job, and I went into a four-year concurrent degree, education degree, which was which was very, very good and very, very interesting. Um, I taught for uh, I taught for seven years until I realized I wanted to be a teacher. I'm going to say that again because that's a bit profound. So I was teaching for seven years before I realized. What I, that I wanted to be a teacher and I have really embraced and loved teaching ever since. So if there was one thing I could do to, to go back at my early days is I, I worry what type of teacher I was for those first seven years and what my students experienced and really did I give them the best I could. So if I could change anything, I would probably delay my entry into education, maybe till 20. And maybe I might have been a little bit more mature when dealing with these young people, because the the charge that we have, the 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 job that we have is 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 huge, is huge. And we're I was teaching young people at 21 years old, so I was teaching an 18 year old when I was 21. Uh, so if I could change that and 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 allow myself to to be trained as a teacher and then kind of enter in a enter a type of apprenticeship role. 
where I had a mentor and funny in the job that I'm at, at at the moment where I deal with newly appointed school leaders. That's what we do when they're appointed as a principal. They get a mentor to journey for the year and then they get coached. And I would love to have had that opportunity. And in fact, that opportunity has, is now in in Ireland uh, through a bridging program that you don't qualify at 21 and get left, left off into the wild. You do have a mentor and you're supported along the way. So, yes, that's the one thing that I would love my early years to have been uh, have had a little bit more support. OK, good question or a little bit of a reflection uh, into the past. Um, it looks like there are no more questions, uh, so I think maybe we can wrap this up. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Donald, for your time. It was great to hear your story, and I really hope the participants uh, got a lot out of it. Um, like I said, the recording will be shared, um, and I think that's about it. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Nikki, for having me and for your collaboration over the last number of weeks. Thank you for taking the time.